can't thank you enough. Well, that's all right, miss. The coast's clear. You can investigate to your heart's content. Oh, the sweet little ups and downs. Oh, yes, we got plenty of those. And the dirty little crooked steps. Oh, yes, you, you mind them little steps, miss. There's something cruel in the dark corners. You took your time. No one here? I've had a telegram, Mr. Prodmore, from Captain the Honourable Clement Yule. Well, not to say he ain't coming. Well, he used to take the 220 train from Paddington. He certainly should be here, sir. My flyaway daughter, where the deuce is she? She and her maid were to have taken the 140 from her grandmother's place near Belborough. I was to drive over from the most convenient of my seats. Captain Newell was finally to shake off for a few hours the peculiar occupations that engage him. We were to converge. Oh, I'm surprised he hasn't been here before, so just to see what has been left, I was expecting you up here so as I could show him round. I'll take him round, never fear. Round and round. Oh, that's good, sir. That's exactly what I've come for. He can't fail to be affected, though he has been up to his neck in matters of a different... Class. In nothing I dare say but what's right, sir. And everything is diabolically wrong. There he is. Your daughter, sir. Cora, the dickens you mean by being late? I, I feel rather faint. Could I have some tea? Since I should expect much of you this afternoon, yes. Some tea. I did think it might be required, sir. I lay it out in the morning room here. It was my train, Papa. I was so awfully behind. Also, I walked up from the station. There's such a lovely footpath across the park. Roaming the countryside alone? Oh, dear, no, no, not alone. There were ever so many people about. I don't doubt there were. Where amongst these multitudes, pray, is your maid? I didn't bring her. She was extremely unwell. I thought she understood at the first that we do not permit. Anything of the sort? Yes, Papa, I thought she did. What on earth's the matter with her? I think that a granny, she eats too much. Well, I'll soon put a stop to that. You expect to continue your adventures then, into the night? Returning to Belborough as you came, at loose on the face of the planet? No, Papa, dear. Under the protection of a new friend. A lady I met in the train who was also going back by the 619. She was like myself on her way to this place. I expected to find her here. What does she want in this house? She wants to see it. Today? Oh, today won't do. So I suggested. Do you know what she said? How should I know what a nobody says? She's not a nobody. She's an American. An American? She asked me if this isn't a show house. I said I hadn't the least idea. It is, of course it is. What the devil would she think of you for not knowing that? <laughs> She's tremendously clever. There seems to be nothing she doesn't know. There seems to be nothing you do. You're not tremendously clever, so you'll permit me to demand of you a slight effort of intelligence. I am expecting Captain, the Honourable Clement Yule. The owner of this property? He came into it three months ago by the death of his great uncle. Never laid eyes on it. But doesn't Captain you live here now? On the contrary, he comes here for the first time. I have some business to discuss with him. I want you to take pains to make him welcome. In his own house? It is not his own house. That's precisely the point I am making. The way I look at it, it is my house. It's mortgaged for every penny of its value as it stands. And I'm in the happy position. You follow me? Of holding the mortgages? I hold every scrap of paper. Do you mean that you can come down on him? I don't need to come down, my dear. I am down. I came down, financially speaking, many weeks ago, and I haven't budged since. Are you going to be very hard? Hard is a stupid shuffling term. What do you mean by it? Well, I don't understand business. I think I understand you, Papa. Enough to gather that, as usual, you have a striking advantage. As usual, I have scored. But my advantage will not be striking until I've sent the blow home. I look to you, as my daughter, to nerve my arm. 
For what? This, the most important transaction of my life. I brought you here to make an impression. On whom? On me, for a start, by not being a fool. And then, miss, on him. On Captain Yu? You must bring him to the point. Father, what point? The point where a gentleman has to. Go down on his knees, you no, mean? No, 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 they don't do that now. Well, well, what do they do? Well, he will know himself. Oh, no, indeed he won't. They never do. The sooner they learn, whoever teaches them, the better. I guarantee he shall understand that, for I shall do my part. Father, all great men get carried away sometime by their wonderful schemes. This is not how such things happen. In the first place, I've never even seen him. That you will do very soon. He's remarkably handsome, remarkably ambitious, and remarkably clever. Yes, but he probably He won't. has one of the best and oldest names in this part of the country. A name which far and wide here one could do so much with. I'm indignant to see him do so little. I propose, my dear, to do with it what he hasn't. And I further propose, to that end, first, to get hold of it. Through you. Father, I have Don't just Don't tell explained. me that's not how these things are done. I've seen more marriages arranged between breeding and brass than any man in the country. You will pick his name up out of the dust. Then when we've rubbed it off and brushed it down, blown away the dust, touched up the rust, you will gracefully bear it. That is my plan. And pray, is it also Captain Newell's plan? His plans have not yet quite matured. But nothing is more natural than that they should do so on the sunny south wall of my daughter's best manor. You exaggerate, I think, the warmth of my manor. It has always been thought remarkably cold. And then you'll be so good, my dear, as to confound, or perhaps even scandalize that opinion. I've spent 20 years giving you what your poor mother used to call advantages. It's cost me hundreds and thousands of pounds. The time has now come when both as a parent and a man of business, I should get my money back. How can you I be so I couldn't help your temper, nor your taste, nor your unfortunate resemblance to that estimable, though far from ornamental woman who brought you forth. Thank you. But I paid out a small fortune that you should have, damn you, a good manner. You never show it to me, certainly. You mean to tell me at this late hour you haven't got one? To people who are particularly civil to me, yes. Captain Ewell may not think I have a good manner. Well, don't look at him like a sick turkey, and he'll be sure to think right. What I don't understand is why you want him at all. After all I've heard you say about his socialism. This radical program. The social revolution. The planned plundering of everyone and the destruction of everything. He will renounce his low opinions for you. He won't renounce them and that will be that. Oh, you mean you are of the same political persuasion and therefore will take him as he is? I won't take him at all. Well, that must be he. Surely you don't want me to bounce on him like this. What are you telling me after what it cost me that your frock won't do? It's not my frock. He's just thinking I'm here to be looked over. He doesn't think it, and he shan't know it. He knows you want me to hook him. The way to hook him is not to be hopelessly vulgar. He doesn't know that you know anything. Await us in the morning room, and mind you toe the line. Don't kill me, Father. Give me time. Captain, the Honourable Clement Yule, sir. Delighted to see you here at last, sir. If I have not come here before, Mr. Prodmore, it was, very frankly, from the dread of seeing you. Oh, I hope you'll feel differently before long. Certainly, I have no illusions about the basis of our meeting. Your remarkable financial acumen has placed me at your mercy. You hold me in the hollow of your hand. Well, I won't deny when I go in deep. I don't go in for nothing. I make it pay double. Double hardly does you justice. Well, you know, you could always clear the property, pay off the mortgages. Pay off? With what? You could always raise money. On what? Your great political future. Oh, I haven't taken the lucrative line politically. I think you know that. I hold that politically you keep very dangerous company. I also hold that you're reckless because you've got nothing at stake. A man has the right opinions the minute he has something to lose by having the wrong. Do you brim over with worldly wisdom, Mr. Broadmoor? You're only a firebrand because you're an impecunious bachelor. Haven't I already hinted what your course should be? Marry, Captain. 
Marry money. So of course, I could do that in a moment. I know any woman would jump at you. I don't like jumping women. More to the point, I've yet to see the woman at whom I would jump. Well, now, I haven't asked you to jump at anyone. All I suggested a month ago was that you should think about things. Yes, I have thought about it, and it seems to me if the worst came to the worst, I could always let it go. Throw up the property? Isn't it the property that's throwing me up? If I can afford neither to live in it nor to pay it off, surely the simplest thing is to say, take it, dear sir, and be hanged to you. You wouldn't be so shockingly rude. Why not, if I'm a firebrand? Sacrifice for sacrifice, that might well be the least. Oh, Carl, now that you stretch yourself for the first time in the ancient cradle of your line, can you seriously entertain the idea of parting with it? The cradle of my line bears to me, Mr. Prodmore, a remarkable resemblance to its tomb. Musty, mangy, mouldy. Is this its character throughout? Well, it does look a bit run down. Mm. I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll do it up for you. I'll throw that in. Will you put in electric light? Well, if you meet me halfway. We're dealing with uniqueness here, you know. Don't you feel a kind of shiver down your spine as you take it all in? What I do feel is a distinct air of depression, age, mercilessness, the human lives this place has eaten up. Well, look around a bit more. Make yourself at home. I'm sure you'll change your mind. Well, that's very kind of you. Do you mind if I light a cigarette? In your own house, Captain. Oh, that's just the point. It seems so much less my own now than before I saw it. So, as I understand you, you lump your two conditions together. Either I accept both or neither. You will accept both. But in so doing, you'll clear the property at a stroke. The way I see it is this. You resign your present seat and stand for Gossage as a Conservative. You stand for Gossage, you'll get returned for Gossage. And if I'm returned for Gossage, I marry your daughter. And if I marry your daughter... I make a bonfire before your eyes of every mortgage on the property. There won't be a penny to pay. You can settle down here in comfort and honour. There's very little honour in turning one's political coat. Well, you'll only be turning it back to the way it was always worn by your family. Gossage will receive you with open arms and press you to a heaving Tory bosom. That bosom has never heaved but to sound conservative principles. The constituency of Gossage has been the political property of your family for generations. You stand in the old interests and you'll stand like a lion. If you're so hot for Gossage, why the deuce don't you stand for it yourself? Because I'm not a handsome young man with a grand old home and the right old name. It is precisely because I do not have these advantages that I intend to see that my daughter has. I'm prepared to pay a very high price. You come high, but you're the real thing. I intend, Captain, that you shall be the true comfort of my life. I ask if Miss Prodmore's ideas of comfort are as well defined as her father's. Does she, is she party to this ingenious arrangement? Miss Prodmore, Captain Newell, may best be described as a large, smooth sheet of blank, though gilt-edged, paper. For your signature to appear on it, she has only to set eyes on you. Like the prince in the fairy tale. You remember what you said when I first, in London, laid this matter before you? Yes, it struck me that I should first look at the house, that it had started all the fuss. I am willing to go even further. I am ready to hear you say you should also first Take a look at the young lady, too. <laughs> There is something in that. I think you'll find there's everything. Which will you take first? Do you mean your daughter's here? In the morning room. Waiting for me? For as long as you like. Oh, longer than this, please. Do you mean she knows? That she's here on view? She knows nothing whatever. She is as unconscious as a rose on its stem. Please let her remain so. I'll first take the house. I'll go with you. No, on my own, please. Uh, begging your pardon, Captain, you, sir, but uh, there's tea on. I'll join my daughter, then. A rose on its stem.
I say I don't. Uh, Chivers, sir. Ah, well then, Chivers, have you by any chance taken notice of the young lady in the morning room? Uh, I have marked her, sir, yes. Did you happen to notice if she's pretty? Well, sir, so isn't it uh, at the same time so largely like a, a matter of taste? Preeminently, that is why I appeal with such confidence to yours. Yeah, well, sir, I've always fancied something more merry-like, Miss Oh, she's not merry-like, poor Miss Prodwell. Well, if you come to that now, then am I. What about you, Chivers? Are you merry-like? Oh, well, sir, I'm not quite that, no. Well, whatever it has the mean to make me, sir. To whom do you belong? Oh, if you could only just tell me, sir, I seem quite a waste away for someone to take an order on. Who pays her wages? Yeah, no one at all, sir. Oh. Well, then, here's a sovereign. And I haven't many. Oh, in that case, sir, it shouldn't it stay in the family? I believe it does, Chivers. I've served you, her, sir, all my life. Then I shan't give you up. I hope you won't give anything up, sir. Is that the garden? <laughs> it was. No, don't come. I want to think. I forgot to tell anyone about you. Dear, delightful man, why didn't you tell me? To tell you, ma'am. Why, that you're so perfectly perfect. You're everything in the world you ought to be, and not the shade of a shade of anything you ought. Uh, me, ma'am? Yes, you too, you positive old picture. The house is a vision of beauty, and you're simply worthy of it. I can't say more for you. Uh, tell the truth, I find a bit of a job to give up what you do say, ma'am. That's what everybody says. You are so fatally right and so deadly complete, all the same, that I can scarcely bear it with every fascinating feature that I've already heard of and was prepared for, and ever so many others that I hadn't and wasn't, and that you just spring at me like a series of guns going off, like some sort of royal salute. I knew as soon as you were right, you knew more than I'd ever heard of. Oh, I had got you by heart from books and drawings and photos. It's all here, every inch of it. And now, at last, I can do what I want. And pray, ma'am, what might that be? Why, I take you right back with me to Missouri Top. Do I understand, Mum, you're required to take me? You mean to say you've come? Then do, you marvelous real thing. It's just what I'm dying for, an old family servant. I shall have you packed, put up in paper and bran, as I shall have my porcelain here. Don't you just love old crockery? This is the sweetest old Chelsea. Well, haven't I seen this very bit somewhere? I know, the Pewokner's house. Best bedroom or the chest of drawers. I got the chest of drawers, too, and the brass fender, and the fire irons, and uh, the chair her grandmother died in. <laughs> I've had hold of this a thousand times. Now it's yours, I'm suddenly nervous. You wouldn't do that. Oh. Mercy on us, ma'am, what can I say? I brought shame to my old grey hairs. I'd sooner have broken a leg. Oh, that's the way you take it. You're too quaint to live. Uh, your pardon, ma'am? The way you said that just now was just the very type. It's like everything over here is just natural to you. You can't help your own perfection. Oh, nothing perfect to being clumsy, ma'am. That's what comes of acting above my station. I'm a gardener, really. Got promoted for the want of competition, you might say. There was a type in the train with me, the awfully nice girl of all the English novels. She couldn't help it either. She was coming here, by the way. She come. Uh, Miss Podmore's here, Miss. Uh, she's having your tea. Oh, that's exactly it. <laughs> They're always having their tea. Uh, with Mr. Podmore in the morning room, uh, Captain Yule is in the garden. I'm afraid none of them uh, don't meet you here, ma'am. Who's Captain Yule? Oh, uh, uh, Captain the Honourable, he's the new master. He's just arrived. Oh, she didn't tell me about him. Yeah, well, ma'am, it's a strange thing to tell. He'd never like so much as seen the place. His own house? Well, I hope he likes it. Haven't seen many as like it as much as you, ma'am. I should like it still better if it were my very own. Well, ma'am, if it wasn't against my duty, I could wish indeed it were. Uh, but the captain is the lawful heir. That's another of your lovely old things. I adore your lawful heir. <laughs> he's come to take possession. Uh, he's taking you it now. <gasps> what does he do and how does he do it? Can I see? Is there a grand fuss? Oh, I scarce think him the gentleman to make any fuss about anything. Well, perhaps I like them better when they don't. I also have taken possession in my way. Yeah, you took it first, ma'am. Ah, but for a poor little hour. He's for life. For mine, ma'am, I at least hope. I shall think of you, you know, here together. Will he be kind to you? Oh, he already has been, ma'am. Then be sure to be so to him. Uh, that's Mr. Prodmore. He wants some more hot water. Oh. Oh. Captain Ewell. 
Hi, Mrs. Grace to you. Mrs. Grace. Grace. I'm delighted to meet you. It's such a comfort to ask if I actually may. May, ma'am. Oh, don't tell me that I can't, because I already have. I've been upstairs and downstairs and in my lady's chamber. I got round your old servant. If you don't look out, I'll grab him. If you don't look out, I'll grab everything. That's what I came over for, just to lay your country waste. Your house is a wild old dream. And besides, you've got some quite good things here. Don't you know you have? We just look at this. It's Limoges. Don't you know anything? Well, it seems absurd, but I'm not in the least acquainted with this house. In fact, I've never, in actual fact, seen it. Then do let me show it to you. Well, I should be delighted. <laughs> Begging your pardon, Captain, sir, but Mr. Prodmore would like to know if you're kindly ready to look over the house and... Uh, and, uh, Will you tell Mr. Prodmore that I'm just about to be shown the house to us? I promised to show Miss Prodmore around, too. Is she there, Chivers? Uh, yes, Mum, but... Uh, uh... Would you call her? My dear lady, I, I don't even know her. Well, Chivers? There she is. See, she's charming. Miss Prodmore, my dear. Let me introduce Captain Yule. Captain Yule, Miss Prodmore, Miss Prodmore, Captain Yule. Um, may I present you to Mrs. Greystew? Mrs. Greystew, Mr. Prodmore, Mr. Prodmore, Mrs. Greystew. Uh, she's the American lady. Mr. Prodmore, delighted to meet the father of so perfect a specimen. So perfect a specimen, yes. I was just about to show Captain Yule around. Were you now? And Cora, I promised her. Uh, begging your pardon, Mum, but uh, well, that's usually my job. I do it for all the parties, like. Do we get parties, Chibbers? Oh, yes, sir. Oh, from Gossage and Father Field all the time. Is there any money in it? Well, they sometimes uh, show their appreciation of the guide, sir. Then I vote that the magnificent Chivers does the honors. Agreed, Captain Yule? Agreed. Uh, thank you, sir. <coughs> Right. Uh, this, ladies and gentlemen, is perhaps the most important feature, the grand old feudal baronial hall. Being, from all accounts, the most ancient portion of the edifice, it was erected in the very earliest ages. Some do say in the course of the 16th century. However, I say in the 15th. <laughs> My dear, you're robbing us of a hundred years. <laughs> I do seem in them dark old centuries uh, to uh, trip a little. Uh, the uh, Gothic roof uh, is much admired, uh, but the West Gallery is a modern addition. What and... in the name of Methuselah do you call modern? It was here at the visit of James I in 1611, and is supposed to have served in the charming detail of its ornament as a model for several that were constructed in his reign. The great fireplace is Jacobean. Observe, in the center compartment, the family arms. And observe the family legs. <laughs> the third earl died of a rage he fell into when Henry VIII won his favorite hound off him at tennis. Observe the suit of armor worn at Tewkesbury. Observe the tattered colors carried at, uh, at, Blenheim. at Blenheim. Observe the hole here in the paneling where a jealous neighbor discharged a pistol at the sixth earl after losing it a game of cards. Observe, above all, that you're in one of the most interesting old houses of its type in England, for which the ages have been tender and the generations wise, letting it change so slowly that there's always more left than taken, living their lives in it, but letting it shape their lives. You do, madam, bring the whole thing out, doesn't she indeed, Cora? But who in the world wants to keep it in? Oh, just look at those lovely lines. Look at the tone of that glass and the carving of that chair and the cutting of that oak and the dear old flags of the very floor. To look in this place is to love. You hear that, Captain? I don't think Captain Yule cares. He doesn't do justice to... To what, madam? To the value of your house. I'd like to hear you express it. I can't express it. It's inexpressible. Oh, try, madam. Try a little assessment. Well, the value's a fancy value. Exactly. When a thing's unique, it's unique. It's worth anything you like. 20,000? I wouldn't look at 20,000. She wouldn't look at 20,000. 30, as it stands. It would be giving it away. You hear that, Captain? You'd hold out for 40. 50 is, I think, what I should propose if I were selling the house, and not a penny less. 50,000? Ah, but he wouldn't part with it. Not the ancestral home. Mrs. Grace, you may I speak to you alone? Please? Mrs. Grace, you may I speak to you alone? After the Captain, child. Meanwhile, Chivers can show you the rest of the house. Chivers, on with the tour. Yes, sir. I shall be in the morning room. Pile it on. Pile it on. How do you come to know so much about my house? How do you come to know so little? Well, a combination of misfortunes has forbidden me until this hour to come within a mile of it. Why, you poor thing. Now at last you've got here, I hope at least you'll stay. 
Do make yourself comfortable. Don't mind me. Well, that's just what I wanted to say to you. I already have made myself comfortable, wouldn't you say? Well, you certainly have the air of mistress of the house. Then you must let me put you up. Up to what? Up to everything. You were smoking as you came in. Where's your cigarette? Well, I thought perhaps it wasn't permitted in here. It's permitted everywhere. Everywhere? It's a rule of the house. <laughs> what delightful rules. How could such a house have any others? I may go up just once more to the uh, long gallery, may I? The long what? Oh, I forgot. You've never even seen it. It's what I mainly came over for. Come right up. Where in heaven's name did you come over from? From Missouri Top, where I'm building just in this style. I came over for ideas. I felt I must look right at you. What did you know about us? Everything. At Missouri Top? It's a growing place, 40,000 at the last census. My husband left it to me. You're a widow. A very lone woman. You see, I had a drawing. Watercolors of your divine South Front that I found in Boston. In Boston? The drawing so struck me that I got you off in the books. Are we in the books? I knew where in heaven's name have you come over from? The East End of London. What were you doing there? Working. You see, when I left the army, life was too slow for me. And then I realized that for a fighting man, it was terribly important There's that always I... someone to do battle with. Yes, the enemy. Misery, ignorance, injustice, privilege. As an MP, my place has been with my constituents. That's why you haven't been able to get down here. Yes, that and a family feud. A family feud. Oh, <laughs> that just rounds it off and completes the heartbreak with which I shall leave this place. I may go up just once more for, for a last look. Yeah, but only if you tell me this. If you absolutely meant what you said a while back about this old thing being so precious. But can you stand here and not feel it? It's a place to love as... As what? As you love a person. Goodbye. The greater the pity, then, that I shall have to give it up. Why on earth? It's mortgaged up to the hilt. And I haven't even the money to pay off the interest. So I see it at last, only to lose it. I never heard of anything so dreadful. Surely there's a way of... Uh... Way One has already been proposed. And for heaven's sake, accept it. I've decided that I can't. Why not? The dividing wolf who has gathered all the mortgages requires me to do something... Something wrong? Infinitely. Something immoral? Literally. Is it too bad to tell? <sighs> he requires me to change my politics. Oh. Is that all? I changed mine for that set of fire irons. What? They're 300 years old. How old are your wretched political opinions? Now, madam, you are speaking to a committed radical. It's my entire political history that we're talking about. Everything I've said and done. He wants me to turn back to France and stand for Gossage as the highest of Tories. Well, why doesn't Mr. Broadmore stand himself? I'm the bearer of my name, the representative of my family. Of course, you're adored by the countryside. Only as a genuine Yule. A genuine Yule is a Tory of Tories. Why does Mr. Broadmore want a conservative at Gossage? It's born of his fear, his terror on behalf of property, of which he owns a great deal. He thinks things have gone too far, getting out of hand. Well, so they are. Aren't you, then, a lover of justice? Passionately. Where's the justice of your losing this house? To keep it, you must stand for Gossage. As a turncoat? As a Yule. What right have you to be anything else? If you do... I will conduct your campaign. Well, that puts the temptation high. Well, look at me as if I were the temptation. Look at this old human home and feel all its gathered memories. Do you know what they say to you? They say you must do, for their sake, what Mr. Broadmoor wants. Gathered memories are all very well, but you see, I deal with real human beings, and my ancestral memories aren't going to do anything to improve the wretchedness of their lives. We share the fate of poor humanity, whatever we do. And we do something to console when we have something precious to show. What on earth is more precious than what the ages have slowly wrought? It's such a virtue in anything to have lasted. What a plea for looking backward, my dear lady, to come from Missouri Top. We're making a past at Missouri Top as fast as ever we can. You've no idea how lucky you are over here to have been born into one. It's delicious. It's like hearing you defend hereditary gout. I suddenly realized why I'm here. I'm here for an act of salvation, to avert a sacrifice. You're here, dear madam, I think, to be a memory for all of my future. If I can retain you, standing by that hearth, you'll be one for mine. Why do you make such a fuss about changing your politics? Parties and programs come and go, but a duty like this abides. This is a temple. Don't profane it. Keep up the old altar kindly. You can't set up a new one as good. You must have beauty in your life, don't you see? That's the only sure way of keeping it in the lives of others. Keep leaving it to the others, to all the poor others. Heaven only knows what will become of it. 
Does it take an American to make you see that? Then it's a good job we came over to see what you're up to. You know, you've a style which the Commons hasn't fitted me to deal with. You know, when you talk of this house, it's as though your voice comes to me like the south wind in its chimneys. I hope you don't mean I roar. The wind doesn't roar here. It whispers, it sighs. I hope it sometimes laughs. Whatever it does, it's all right. Oh, then you promise. Promise what? To meet Mr. Prodmore. Oh, not yet. I, I must think. W uh, when have you to answer him? Oh, he gives me time. I wouldn't give you time. I'd give you a shaking. For God's sake, at least go and see him. Do you mean literally seek the dreadful man out? May I confide in you? You too? It is a good job we came over. It is indeed. What I want to tell you is that when I finally got here from the station, I was met with the most tremendous news. He wants me to marry him. Oh, that's good. Who? Papa settled it. Uh, settled what? The whole question that I must take him. But my dear, take whom? My Captain Yule, of course. Oh. Oh? I thought you would know. No. No, I didn't know. Uh, has Captain Yule asked you? Nobody will, to keep the house. That's Papa's price, to marry me and change his politics. But of course, it'll only happen if he loves the house enough. And if he's willing to change. Does he? Will he? Yes. I think he does. Yes. I believe he will. Now. Oh, I... I... Have you seen Mrs. Grace to you about at all? She went out into the garden. She said she wanted to think. I want to talk to her some more, but when I went out there, she wasn't there. Oh, there you are. How did you arrive there? There are more ways into this house, I believe, than even dear old Chivers knows about. I'll no doubt you're waiting to learn if I've closed with Mr. Prodmore. I thought he gave you time. Yes, but you produced just now so deep an effect on me, I thought it best not to take any. Oh. I felt the tremendous effect of all that you said to me. You're perhaps not aware that you wield an influence that is practically irresistible. I have rarely been exposed to such a fire. When I burn, well, I do it as Chicago does, down to the ground. <laughs> I suppose you've still the uh, formalities to go through. None. You've concluded totally, then? I've turned him down. What? I dare not reflect further. Your magnetism is frightening. I had to follow my conscience instantly if I was not to surrender to your siren song. You've just given me the most flattering proof of my persuasive powers I've ever had in my I've life. I've no doubt that you're disgusted with me, and I am sorry. But you see, I see something else in the world other than the beauty of old show houses and the glory of old show families. There are thousands of people in England who can show no houses at all, and I'm more concerned with them. Were I to turn my coat and abandon them, I could live in the greatest palace in the world and still hate myself. No! I'll listen to no more of your enchantments. The thing's done. I stand by it. What was he telling you? Has he concluded with my father? Not exactly. He wants to look me over more thoroughly, perhaps, as he did the house. I think not. Cora, my dear, would you mind very much if he turned your father down? Mind? He'd make me the happiest girl alive. What? But I, I thought you said... I said I'd be bored at him, like a dose of medicine. Oh, excuse me, I... I misunderstood. I somehow took it for granted that you... You took it for granted that I'd jump at him. Well, I don't. And I shan't. I don't care what father says. My dear, you won't have to. He's turned your father down. You mean I won't have to marry him? <laughs> I must say, I would not have thought Captain Yule was such a terrible fate for a girl. Oh, I agree with you. He, he seems a gentleman full of grace. It's, it's just that there's, well, there's... There's someone else. 
I've been trying this eye in my terrible need of advice to tell you about him. After we parted, you and I at the station, he suddenly turned up there, this someone else, and I took a quiet little walk with him, which is why you got here before me, and of which my father is in a state of ignorance that I don't know whether to regard as desirable or dreadful. You want me, then, to inform you, Father? I really don't know what I want. I think I just want kindness and help. You see, I love him. And does he love you? Oh, yes. He's waiting for me now in that funny old grotto in the park. Does your father know about him? My father has met him, yes. But we've been so sure that Papa would hate any liaison between us that we've had to be so awfully careful. Why? What's wrong with him? Oh, there's nothing wrong with him. He's the son of the richest man in Belborough. He'll inherit his father's business just simply amends. And from the point of view of things, he's in is quite as good as Papa himself. Well, then why would your father object? His name and his politics. What's his name? It's hyphenated. The first part is hat uh, with a double T. Well? The second part is peg with a double G. Mrs. Hat Peg. Yes. And his politics? Radical. Oh, dear me. Is the whole of England turning anarchist or what? I will help you. Oh, you have a living. Mr. Hatpeg. If all goes well, we shall meet at the station. Go. Where's my daughter? I thought I heard her. Your daughter is not here, but it is a convenience to me, Mr. Parkmore, that you are. I have something very particular to ask you. I'll be happy to answer your question, but I must first put my hand on Miss Prodmore. Unless she's occupied out there with Captain Yule, she may be brighter than I think. There's more than one way to skin a cat. I don't think she's occupied with cats or Captain Yule anywhere. Well, where the deuce is she? I wish to instruct her. She is not open to instruction. At this moment, her mind is too preoccupied with young Mr. Pegg. With whom? I mean young Mr. Pegg of Belper, Mr. Hat Pegg, the associate of his father in their flourishing firm to whom Miss Prodmore is devotedly attached. Hat, hat Pegg. At, 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 attached. It's gone as far as that? It has gone so far, you might as well let it go the rest of the way. How monstrous to have plotted to keep me in the dark. It's your fault for making your daughter afraid of you. She's an honest girl and she's not a baby. She's a perfect right to her preference. Have I no right to mine? Not at her expense. I see your hand in this. You turned Yule against me and now my daughter. On the contrary, I threw everything into the battle on your side. I'm so glad we lost. We? I'm the only one who's lost. I've lost Captain Yule. I've lost Gossage. I'm threatened with a radical for a son-in-law, and I'm landed with this mausoleum. I thought you adored it. Adored it? I? Madam, I live in a modern house, built these five years to my own specification. I wouldn't be paid to live in one of these old rat traps. Then you'd be quite relieved to have it taken off your hands. Ah, oh, well, now, uh, that would depend. In what way would you mean, dear lady? I know, sir, of only one way. If you will name your figure, I will buy you out. Oh, but I'm not sure that I wish to sell. Why, you just said... I said I wouldn't live in it. That's not the same as saying I don't know its value. I know a lot of people who would live in it and pay through the nose to do so. That is insubstantial conjecture. I am here as flesh and blood to make you an offer. I will refund you whatever you are in for in return for your interest in the house. But the value of the house is far greater than that. But surely the value of the house is what you paid for. On the contrary, dear lady, it is what you are willing to pay for it. I will pay what you paid plus a small profit for you. Yeah, I'm afraid not. You see, you put your own excellent valuation on this house not a great deal of time ago. You were very eloquent, I recall. I was play-acting, pretending to be a guy. Oh, you were more like an auctioneer, taking bids. Oh, you ran it up high. I said it was charming, certainly. Charming? You said it was magnificent. You said it was unique. You talked of fancy values. The perfect specimen of its class in England, you called it. Oh, you got in deep. Possibly. But taunting me with my absurd high spirits doesn't in the least tell me how deep you are in. For you, Mrs. Grace Dew, I am in to the tune of 50,000. That is a great deal of money. Yes, isn't it? 
If it's a large one for you, it's even larger one for me. We women have more modest ideas. Modest? Is that what you call your intrusion into my affairs? I mean, we measure things often more exactly. You measured this thing exactly about half an hour ago. You said you'd offer 50. I was trying to please you. Have you seen Miss Prodmore? If you haven't, find her. You won't find her, Chivers. She's gone for a walk. Alone? No, with uh, Mr. Pegg. Pegg has been here? He walked her from the station. So that's why she was late. Which direction did they take? I think I must let you find that out for yourself. Get my carriage. I was right. You aided and abetted this wicked, low intrigue. Believe me, I did not. But I did promise Cora I'd speak up for her. I can't see her made miserable by losing the chance of her life. You can't see her. Do drive after them if you must. But do so only to forgive them. If you do that, I'll pay your price. What is your idea of my price? Why, the sum you just mentioned. 50,000. That's not my price. It never for one moment was. Besides, my price is up. Up? 70,000. Oh, dearie me. Take it or leave it. 70,000 then. Done. I've been waiting for him to go. I wanted to apologize. I must have seemed very ungracious just now, but you... And I know you're right about the house and my duties to it, and I do care about it, really. It's just that for me, the conditions laid down were impossible. The conditions no longer exist. You mean Prodmore relents? He'll deal with me like a decent human being? You do not deal with Mr. Prodmore. I've taken it over. You? Taken over the house? Yes. Well, I do know that you love it, sir. Yes. <laughs> well, I, I don't mind losing it to you. Oh, but you don't lose it. You arrange with me to keep it. How'd I do that? We must wait. We must think. We must find a way. Well, in what way is there to find it? With Prodmore, it was simple. All I had to do was to sell my soul, as it were. I shall require no spiritual sacrifice. All I want you to do is to live in the house as you were meant to. How can I, now that it's yours? I move over for you. You surrender your rights? Weren't you ready to surrender yours? I hadn't any. I hadn't paid for them. Your ancestors had. It's the same thing. You will be, in a manner, my tenant. On what terms? On any terms. The easiest. You can write to me about them to Missouri Top, and I really must go if I'm to catch my train. But how did you do that? How did you manage Prudmore? Never you might. The only way that he would conceive of his surrender would be if you bought him out. That's what you did. You bought him out. And what if I did? For how much? I must know. That you shall never know. I'll get it from him, then. I think not. You mean he won't tell me because he did you, the scoundrel? The important thing is that now you can get on with your life's work, your precious social revolution, without having to give up your home to do it. Can I? I'm not so sure. What do you mean? Well, I mean to say, how can I lead a socialist revolution from a country seat like this? Rubbish. I never knew a prominent socialist yet who couldn't find the money for a country cottage, and they get very large, those country cottages. They like to associate themselves in the public's mind with England's traditions and England's countryside. The two mm. things, oddly, they're usually most active in trying to destroy. You are the most dreadful Tory. The most beautiful, mind you, that I've ever seen. I know a great deal more about the common touch than you ever will. Indeed. If you're really serious about leading the have-nots, first of all, get rid of that honourable. I see. And what about the title that I'll be coming into in due course? What do I do about that? You announce it. There's no machinery for that. You're a legislator. Make the machinery. <laughs> what about my name? Clement, Marmaduke, Clarence, Fitzroy, D'Arblay, you. You shorten the whole thing to Clem you, and you drop the captain also. <laughs> you hold house parties here, where you invite the snobs of the radical movement, and don't tell me there aren't any, for policy-making seminars. You all rough it here together in the name of the revolution. You're also the most dreadful political cynic that I've ever encountered. And you are the most delightful dunce. Women see things as they are. They'll sacrifice any number of policies, yes, and politicians in the name of human comfort and happiness. That is just one thing. Oh, not another objection. I must catch my train. <laughs> it is really rather important. Shall you like being called Mrs. Clem Mule? Shall I what? Shall I like? Well, you really can't come here. Move mountains, clear my way, turn my head, and then expect to be let go. 
But I... Excuse me, Captain, sir. Yes, what is it, Chivers? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's madam, really. Uh, there's an excellent cook in the village, madam. She's about to be snapped up if you don't get in first. Uh, shall I tell her she'll be uh, needed like? Yes, Chivers. Do that. Dearest Clem. We'll put in the electric light and the telephone. And there's a marvelous new... Then when we rubbed it off and brushed it down, blown away the dust, touched up the rust, you will gracefully bear it. That is my plan. And pray, is it also Captain Newell's plan? His plans have not yet quite matured. Oh. But nothing is more natural than that they should do so on the sunny south wall of my daughter's best manor. You exaggerate, I think, the warmth of my manor. It has always been thought remarkably cold. And then you'll be so good, my dear, as to confound, or perhaps even scandalize that opinion. I've spent 20 years giving you what your poor mother used to call advantages. It's cost me hundreds and thousands of pounds. The time has now come when both as a parent and a man of business, I should get my money back. How can you I be I couldn't so help your temper nor your taste, nor your unfortunate resemblance to that estimable, though far from ornamental woman who brought you forth. Thank you. But I paid out a small fortune that you should have, damn you, a good manner. You never show it to me, certainly. You mean to tell me at this late hour you haven't got one? To people who are particularly civil to me, yes. Captain Ewell may not think I have a good manner. Well, don't look at him like a sick turkey and he'll be sure to think right. What I don't understand is why you want him at all. After all I've heard you say about his socialism, this radical program, social revolution. Planned plundering of everyone and the destruction of everything. He will renounce his low opinions for you. He won't renounce them and that will be that. Oh, you mean you are of the same political persuasion and therefore will take him as he is? I won't take him at all. Well, that must be he. Surely you don't want me to bounce on him like this. What are you telling me after what it cost for him in turn? What do you mean by it? Well, I don't understand business. But I think I understand you, Papa. Enough to gather that, as usual, you have a striking advantage. As usual, I have scored, but my advantage will not be striking until I've sent the blow home. I look to you, as my daughter, to nerve my arm. For what? This, the most important transaction of my life. I've brought you here to make an impression. On whom? On me, for a start, by not being a fool. And then, miss, on him. On Captain Yule. You must bring him to the point. Father, what point? The point where a gentleman has to. Go down on his knees, you No, mean? no, no, they don't do that now. Well, well what do they do? Well, he will know himself. Oh, no, indeed he won't. They never do. Well, the sooner they learn, whoever teaches them, the better. I guarantee he shall understand that, for I shall do my part. Father, all great men get carried away sometime by their wonderful schemes. This is not how such things happen. In the first place, I've never even seen him. That you will do very soon. He's remarkably handsome, remarkably ambitious, and remarkably clever. Yes, but he probably He won't. has one of the best and oldest names in this part of the country. A name which far and wide here one could do so much with. 
I'm indignant to see him do so little. I propose, my dear, to do with it what he hasn't. And I further propose, to that end, first, to get hold of it. Through you. Father, I have Don't just explained... Don't tell me that's not how these things are done. I've seen more marriages arranged between breeding and brass than any man in the country. You will pick his name up out of the dust. The protection of a new friend. A lady I met in the train who was also going back by the 619. She was like myself on her way to this place. I expected to find her here. What does she want in this house? She wants to see it. Today? Oh, today won't do. So I suggested. Do you know what she said? How should I know what a nobody says? She's not a nobody. She's an American. An American? She asked me if this isn't a show house. I said I hadn't the least idea. It is, of course it is. What the devil would she think of you for not knowing that? <laughs> She's tremendously clever. There seems to be nothing she doesn't know. There seems to be nothing you do. You're not tremendously clever, so you'll permit me to demand of you a slight effort of intelligence. I am expecting Captain, the Honourable Clement Yule. The owner of this property? He came into it three months ago by the death of his great uncle. Never laid eyes on it. But doesn't Captain Yule live here now? On the contrary, he comes here for the first time. I have some business to discuss with him. I want you to take pains to make him welcome. In his own house? It is not his own house. That's precisely the point I am making. The way I look at it, it is my house. It's mortgaged for every penny of its value as it stands. And I'm in the happy position. You follow me? Of holding the mortgages? I hold every scrap of paper. Do you mean that you can come down on him? I don't need to come down, my dear. I am down. I came down, financially speaking, many weeks ago, and I haven't budged since. Are you going to be very hard? Hard is a stupid shuffle as the peculiar occupations that engage him. We were to converge. I'm surprised he hasn't been here before, so just to see what has been left, I was expecting you up here so as I could show him round. I'll take him round, never fear. Round and round. Oh, that's good, sir. That's exactly what I've come for. He can't fail to be affected, though he has been up to his neck in matters of a different... Class. In nothing I dare say but what's right, sir. And everything is diabolically wrong. There he is. Your daughter, sir. Cora, the dickens you mean by being late? I, I feel rather faint. Could I have some tea? Since I should expect much of you this afternoon, yes. Some tea. I did think it might be required, sir. I lay it out in the morning room here. It was my train, Papa. I was so awfully behind. Also, I walked up from the station. There's such a lovely footpath across the park. Roaming the countryside alone? Oh, dear, no, no, not alone. There were ever so many people about. I don't doubt there were. Where amongst these multitudes, pray, is your maid? I didn't bring her. She was extremely unwell. I thought she understood at the first that we do not permit. Anything of the sort? Yes, Papa, I thought she did. What on earth's the matter with her? I think that a granny, she eats too much. Well, I'll soon put a stop to that. You expect to continue your adventures then into the night? Returning to Belborough as you came? At loose on the face of the planet? No, Papa, dear. Under the... Coast clear, 
You can investigate to your heart's content. Oh, sweet little ups and downs. Oh, yes, we got plenty of those. And the darling little crooked steps. Oh, yes, you'll mind them little steps, miss. There's something cruel in the dark corners. You took your time. No one here? I've had a telegram, Mr. Prodmore, from Captain the Honourable Clement Hume. Well, not to say he ain't coming. Well, you should take the 220 train from Paddington. He certainly should be here, sir. My flyaway daughter, where the deuce is she? She and her maid were to have taken the 140 from her grandmother's place near Belvera. I was to drive over from the most convenient of my seats. Captain Newell was finally to shake off for a few 